Welcome to Scripture Snippets as we continue our study in the book of 1 John, uh, specifically in chapter 2 right now. We've been uh, breaking down chapter 2 a little bit more, getting the little snippets out of that. A huge chapter, so one uh, that you can't really just do with one broad uh, stroke, so to speak. So we're going to be diving back in to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 17 today. We're leading up to the second A of what I like to call it in 1 John. Again, I said in 1 John you can break it down into three A's. The first A is Advocate. We learned in uh, 1 John chapter 1 and a little bit in verse 2 about the beauty that we have by Jesus being our advocate, by standing there before the throne of God and by taking our place and being there for us. The second A is Antichrist. 1 John in the epistle, he tells us how to handle in the future. He tells us about those that will come and present themselves as false teachers, those who will be antichrists, who will be the exact opposite of antichrist, which will lead to the antichrist that he mentions as well uh, with the capital A. And we'll be talking about that a little bit on tomorrow's podcast. Verses 14 through 17, though, is leading up to this. So I want to really talk about that today. So let's go ahead. If you have your Bibles, join with me. If you don't, uh, please open up an app or whatever you may have and, and read along with me. Make sure you're like a Berean and make sure that what I'm teaching you is correct. Make sure that what I'm teaching you is right and that you can see it for yourself because sometimes it's just so much better to see it for yourself. So uh, verse 14 is familiar because we went over it a little bit with the last uh, devotional, but I'm going to go ahead and begin reading it and all the way down to verse number 17. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So beginning with verse 14, John goes on to give a word of encouragement warning and exhortation to each group of believers so he mentions them all again in order the same believers that we mentioned before in the previous verses he broke them down and the fathers he he said fathers and then he said um, for little children and young men he broke them down into those three categories so again he's mentioned them again in this order to the fathers the wise ones he says i've written to you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning john does not add anything to what he said in verse 13 at all it's exactly the same so why doesn't he add anything here why didn't he have anything extra to say to the fathers well because he cannot add to the climax of the christian experience if you remember the fathers of the faith are the ones who are still growing in Christ, but their foundation is so strong that they're, that they love the Lord, that it's been proven. Um, They're really where they need to be. And he's still adding it, sending him, giving them advice and letting them know, but it's not as strong as it's going to be to the little children and to the young men. Because you can't add to what he said. He said you've known him from the beginning. So from the beginning refers to Jesus' incarnation here on earth. You know, it must have been an awesome thing for some of these believers who lived during this time to be able to trace Jesus' actual footsteps as he walked the sands of the earth and to see him in his perfection. I mean, they saw him. God revealed in the flesh. That had to have been an awesome, awesome thing. It's even more wonderful to know him now. I mean, think about this as us today. It's even how awesome and how wonderful it is to know about him now and to know him as the one who passed from life to de- uh, passed from death to life and raised us to the glory of the Father. I mean, it's amazing when we can think about this now, but these men and these women saw him in his fullness and his glory, and that's just awesome. The fact of the reality is there are not many fathers in the faith. People may be very old in Jesus Christ and yet not be fathers in a spiritual sense, just like I mentioned before. Sadly, many who have been Christians for years are still very worldly-minded and know little of true fellowship with Christ. 
Paul earnestly prayed that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul's strength, Paul's resilience, Paul's goal was to be conformed to Jesus Christ. He, that was his goal, that he could know the power of his resurrection. That he could actually be in fellowship with his sufferings, that the same sufferings that Jesus had suffer, Paul wanted to suffer as well and being made conformed into his death. It's this personal knowledge of God that constitutes one a father in Christ. This is the height of Christian maturity and comes through a life of intimate fellowship with Christ. Again, that's what I mentioned before, is that when you're a father of the faith, when you're, when you're a father there, you've reached that point to where you exude and you shine Jesus Christ. When people look at your life, when people see you, that's the descriptive verb they use, the the descriptive adjective, I'm sorry. The adjective that they use is that you look like Christ, that you example and you exude Jesus Christ. You have that relationship and that fellowship with him, that man, when people see you, they say, hey, I know he's a Christian. I know he's someone I can count on. He is the example of Jesus Christ. Next, the apostle turned his attention to those who have not reached the depths of experience that the fathers have, and yet they're strong, vigorous Christians, just as I said in the last one. He said, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. That's in verse 14. When he spoke to them previously, he simply said, I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. But now he reveals the secret of that overcoming, how they did overcome the wicked one. They are not strong in their own power, but they're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, as in Ephesians verse six Ephesians chapter six verse ten says. In other words, you're strong because the word of God abides in you. Many of us spend the greater part of the week solely occupied with the little things of earth. Um, and that in themselves seem very right and legitimate. You know, we all have our responsibilities and we all have our different things that we need to attain to in life. And those things are a priority and we should pay attention to those and we should do those things. Jesus Christ has given us those responsibilities as well. It is your responsibility to do things like pay your bills. It is your responsibility to work as we read in the book of Proverbs. It is your responsibility to take care of your children, to raise your children. It is your responsibility to love and take care of your spouse. Those things are very important and are crucial, and you should spend time doing those. So don't discount these. But isn't it funny how one of the most important responsibilities, if not the most important responsibility, most of us only relegate to maybe touching once a week, coming together for Bible study and worship? I mean, that's like if you were to sit down and only eat one good meal a week. How do you think your body would be? If you only sat down and only ate one good meal a week for the rest of your life, do you really think your health is going to be very good? No, it's not. You're going to suffer. You're going to come down with diseases like diabetes. You're going to be overweight. Or if you don't eat at all, you're not going to have enough strength. You're going to have vitamin deficiencies so on and so forth. So why do we treat Bible study and worship and prayer so casually when it's our lifeline? It should be a priority just as much as those other priorities I mentioned to you are. We need to elevate those because that is the admonition that John gave to these young men. He said you've overcome the wicked one because you abided in God's word. Again, it says, verse 14, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. The word of God abides in them. That's what gave them their strength, and that's what gave them the ability to overcome the wicked one. They were able to remember the promises of God. Look at how Jesus handled the temptation. When he was taken out into the wilderness, what did he rely upon? Yes, he always relied upon the strength of the Father, so don't get me wrong and don't twist my words. But what did he use? What was the main thing that he used? He used scripture. He quoted the Old Testament, especially the book of Deuteronomy, many times to Satan in response to each of his temptations. 
So shouldn't we take that example? If we say that Jesus is our example in life, shouldn't we do the same? Well, how are you going to handle temptations if you don't know the Word of God as it is? You may know a verse here or two, but do you know a verse to tackle every single life hurdle that comes your way? And listen, it's there. The Bible is there. The Bible is rich, and the Bible can help you in each and every hurdle of your life. You just have to study it and get into it. That's really the purpose of the Scripture Snippets, is that I hope each and every day you can learn a little bit more that can help you tackle these events in your life. And man, what an amazing one here. Is he's saying that as the time gets closer and closer and closer, because like I said, in this chapter we're leading up to where he's going to talk about the reality of the Antichrist. And he's telling us here that the best way to handle these and to be that example is to abide in his word. So we have to be strong. He says the word of God abides in them. So, you know, there are many Christians out there who think the word of God is something to take up an extra hour or so when they have nothing else to do. That it's a casual thing. It's like picking up a video game or something. But you will never grow that way. What little strength you get from that hour is all used up when you've become occupied with other things. It's something that's quickly forgotten. It's just like that hobby thing, like I mentioned. You don't get anywhere on small doses. When the Word of God is the supreme thing in your life and everything else is made to fit into that, then you will grow and become a strong Christian. Let that be your foundational. Let the time, your time with Christ in prayer and Bible study and seeking His face and doing His work, let that be the foundation. Let that be priority number one. And then you'll be amazed at how those other things can fit in there because they all accomplish those things. Being a faithful worker. Again, the book of Colossians mentions work is unto the Lord and not unto men. And in the book of Proverbs, it very strongly says that we should work. It has a, have a strong work ethic. Get in there. So if work is kind of a thing and you're worried about that, you're saying, well, Andy, I'm so absorbed in my work. I, ain't, I don't have time to really devote much to the Bible. If you, um, Trust me, if you make the Bible your priority, everything else in your work life is going to fall in line as well. Because again, Colossians tells us you don't work for men. You work for the Lord. And he will honor that. And you will be amazed at how your work life will improve. It'll be better because you'll have these these inspirational truths in your life that you can apply to your workplace. And it goes on with everything. Your family. It goes on with your family. Uh, again, I, I challenge you to read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs touches about so much that we run into our every single day of life. So reach out to there. Just get yourself into the Word of God. Hold on to it because it's an amazing, amazing thing. We don't get anywhere on small doses. You need to make sure that you're getting your fill and becoming a strong Christian by abiding in God's Word. The world is bidding for strong young Christians. And its allurements is all around them. The distractions is there. The world wants young Christians for their sake not for Christ's sake. The devil would do anything to trip up an earnest Christian. There are some believers the devil could care less about, but the ones who are out and out for God, Satan pursues with his snares and attractions trying to trip them up. See, the fact of the matter is, is there's some Christians, yeah, Satan doesn't care about because he's already got them where he wants them. They don't do anything. They take on the title Christian, but that's it. It's just a title to them. They don't really live that lifestyle. They really don't spread the message of Jesus. They don't love, really love their neighbors. They love themselves. They don't do anything like that. They just have taken up a title, so to speak. And Satan really doesn't care about them. He's got them where he wants to. The ones that he pays attention to are the ones that are movers and shakers for Jesus Christ. Just like these young fathers, they were attacked and they had to overcome. And that's what he was talking about here. And man, he will come after you. So don't think it's going to be a rose field, because it's not. It's not going to be easy. Well, you know, yeah, it is going to be a rose field for you. It's going to be thorny. It's going to be rough. It's going to be really rough. Something that you're going to have to battle through each and every day. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something where you can lounge on your couch. The Christian life is an active life. Because remember in the book of James it says faith without works is dead. 
and you're going to draw the attention of the enemy. And he's going to put up snares. He's going to put up distractions and everything else to try to trip you up. If you flee from one thing, sure enough, he's going to have another temptation waiting for you around the corner. And so John gives us the exhortation, love not the world. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's telling us here to be careful. And then he keeps on, he goes on. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And he continues. He continues. So really listen to this thing. Do not love the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father. It's not of God. And then verse 17, and the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So it's temporary pleasures. If you focus yourself upon those, those are just temporary pleasures. Don't get distracted by them. Don't get pulled into them. And Satan will use those things. He'll use the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. He'll use those things to distract you and keep you from abiding in God and doing his will. What is this world that we are not to love? It's not, it is not the earth, for that in itself has nothing that can hurt our souls. You can love nature. You absolutely can. There's nothing wrong with being an environmentalist. There isn't. There's nothing anti-biblical about it, as long as you don't worship it. But in fact, there's a very strong admonition to be an environmentalist, because God made us stewards of his creation in the very beginning, and he's never taken that away from us. So in all reality, we are environmentalists. Now we're not to worship it, and we're not to allow it to become our God. But there's nothing wrong with that. You can love nature. You do not need to be afraid of a beautiful view or a lovely flower. No. Some Christians actually do have this idea that we are not to enjoy the world of nature. You know, I remember saying to someone, isn't that a beautiful rose bush? And you replied, I'm not interested in roses. I'm not of this world. That is not the world that is spoken of in Scripture. The universe is actually expression of Father's wisdom and goodness. He created it. So why are you slapping it and trying to say that? You're taking First John out of context. He's talking about a different world here. The Lord loves the lilies of the field. He drew attention to the beauties of nature. They stirred his own soul, and he wants people to see them in the evidence of the wisdom and goodness of the Father. But what is this then? What's this world that we're supposed to hate? It's the system that man has built up on the earth, in which he is trying to make himself happy without God. It's the system that man has tried to create where it takes God out of the picture. But it ended up in corruption and violence, and God had to sweep the whole thing away with God with a flood. If you remember, this all happened once before, and he had to just wipe it clean again with the flood. The principles of the world that caused the corruption and violence before the flood were carried into the ark in the hearts of some of Noah's children. They never left. Man had a sinful nature. Yeah, he wiped it clean, but not truly. It still was in the hearts of men through, through, through Noah's children. They brought the world into the ark, and when they emerged from the flood, they brought the world out of the ark, and they set it up again. So what is then the world which John described as the lust of the flesh also you could look at it as the gratification of the flesh and the lust of the eyes which is of course the desires of our fleshly selves the lust of the eyes it is what it is it's and when people read that a lot of times they take the sexual connotation to it and it is there absolutely that's part of it But it's also looking at maybe what other people have and wanting that for ourselves. It's that covetous nature. Looking at other things around us. Looking at what others have obtained or looking at what areas of success others have and letting that control our life. That's, again, the lust of the eyes as well. 
When some think of the world, they think of things that are abominable, vile and corrupt. They think of things like drunkenness, you know, bars and uh, casinos, and they think of every kind of violence that's out there. They think of gangs and gang warfare, and they think of destitute streets in the city and stuff like that. But these things offer little to attract the Christian heart. They're really not what's attracting the Christian, are they? See, we need to th- we can either remember this. John is talking about stuff that attracts a Christian here. You know, so we shouldn't necessarily be assuming that this thing is talking about the extreme vile things because we know that Christians don't want those things. They've left that. So what is this then? What is this that's attracting a Christian heart? The world a Christian needs to be to beware of is the world of culture. The world that appeals to our aesthetic nature. The world should hold as little attraction for the Christian as the corrupt, abominable world in the slums of our great cities. So don't imagine yourself safe and free from worldliness because your world is in the arts and sciences. No. Don't try to elevate yourself saying, oh, I'm free from temptation because I'm in the Christian world. Because that's where it hits the most. Do you spend the majority of your time? Let's say, I mean, I know I did, especially in my young Christian life. I spent a lot of time in church. It's easy to stay busy in church. It seems like churches try to have activities almost every day of the week now. But do you think just because you participate in those activities that you're free from temptation or safe from temptation? No. You're still tempted by the lust of the eyes and the gratification of the flesh. It's still there, and you still have to overcome, not by attending those things, not by trusting in a pastor, but by abiding in God's Word. By abiding in God's Word. Physical beauty can also get us, get between us and Christ, and will prove to be the world of us if one is not careful. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Again, what did it say for all that is in the world? The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. And that can be many different things. That Again, it's a sexual nature as well. It could be our sexual gratification of the flesh. But it could be that we are overly obsessive with how we look. We can let that become our God. We can take more time in it. Now, now, am I saying that God said not for us to take care of our bodies? Absolutely not, because he said the complete opposite. Again, he gave us these bodies, and he expects us to be proper stewards of them. But they're never to take place above him. And that's what I'm talking about here, Christian, is look at your life. Look at your priorities. Look at how you rank things in your life. And I know I've talked about priorities before, but this is a vastly dangerous thing in today's Christendom. When I look at the world today, and I hear my friends, and it's amazing how they struggle. They say, Andy, I wish I knew the Bible as much as you. And then I ask them, well, how much time do you spend in your Bibles? And they say, well, I just don't have much time. I've got this going on. You know, I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I've, I've got this at work. I work all the time. I work this, you know, 12-hour shifts, you know, five days a week. I've got this going on, this going on. I mean, I hear it time and time and time again. But excuses. It's excuses. And really, when we look at our lives, there's always time in there for the Bible. And again, the the Bible study and our time with Jesus Christ in prayer, our time with Father, should take absolute priority. And I'm not talking about church services here. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus. See, it's not the fact that church attendance is down. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about true, genuine, personal time that you have. That's the most important thing. And that's the only way we're going to overcome evil here. Again, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And he's saying that because that's a distraction from him. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So the promise we have is that if we focus our eyes upon God, 
that those things that he gives us are eternal. They will not pass away. Look at how fleeting some things are. Yeah, go ahead. You can work hard to buy that beautiful, nice car. But what ends up happening to that beautiful, nice car? It breaks down. It gets old. And you end up wanting another one. It's fleeting. It doesn't last very long. New homes. You can go ahead and try to strive to have that nice, big, beautiful home. But what happens? Pipes break. Air air conditioning units go out. Walls crack. It fades away. But what are the things of God? Do they fade away? No, they don't. They're eternal. They're eternal. They're with Him. He promises us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And He's always been there. He's always been a constant. And He will always be there. His love, His admonition will be there. When we reach heaven, it will be a beautiful thing. We won't be concentrated upon possessions. We won't be concentrated on how big our house is up there. We'll be concentrating on God and God and Him not alone. And it'll be amazing because we want to feel loved. Because we'll be in the presence of love. We won't ever doubt if anyone loves us again. We won't ever doubt if we're useful or not. Because we're going to be treasured by a God who loves us. But we'll be treasuring Him. We'll be before His almighty throne, giving Him the praise and the glory for eternity. So my friends, I challenge you in the scripture snippet, don't look out for the things of the world. And again, Christian, be careful. Just because you're a Christian, just because you may keep yourself busy with church things, it doesn't mean that you're free from the temptation of sin. It doesn't mean that you're excluded from having personal Bible study doesn't mean that you're excluded from personal prayer. Jesus had public study. Jesus had public prayer. But when you read the life of Jesus, you also hear how he would constantly go away from the disciples to spend time with the Father. And again, John gives us the admonition here, especially to who he calls the young men, which is where many of us fall in, in Christendom. He tells us, to abide in his word. And that's the only true way for success. So do that, my friends. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you will, give it a like, subscribe, uh, to whatever you're listening to, whether it be Spreaker, whether it be Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, um, the uh, Apple, whatever you're listening on. Do me a favor, give it a like. Leave me a review. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I do have an email set up now for this. It's scripture snippets 316 at gmail.com. Scripture snippets 316 at gmail.com. If you have any ideas for a future episode, let me know. Until then, my friends, remember, abide in God's word, and he will be with you. He will protect you, and you will overcome the evil one.